Dear brothers and sisters, Israel was in the international news once again a few weeks ago. And this time it was not about its handling of the pandemic, but it was about war that had just started there. Hamas started firing rockets indiscriminately into Israel. And even after repeated warning from Israel, it continued and finally Israel had to retaliate by sending in its planes and bombing targets in Gaza. Now the spirit was so high on both sides that this continued for about one week and we saw how many bombs and rockets was fired in Israel. Gaza started firing nearly about 4,000 rockets into Israel. And how Israel defended itself was also very remarkable through its latest uh, Iron Dome defensive system. And all this was in the news and Christians were anxious about this. Because whenever there is war in Israel, those who know prophecy about Israel fear that this might be leading to the final war, the Armageddon war, which will bring the end of this world. Because there are so many prophecies in the book of Ezekiel, in the book of Zechariah, and the book of Revelation, how the final war should happen in Israel, in which the whole world will be at war and will come to an end. So whenever there is some trouble in Israel, we feel that maybe the end is near. It is said that Israel is God's prophetic timepiece. So by looking at the developments in Israel, we can know how near we are to the very end. So though after some negotiation from Egypt and various other countries, a ceasefire has taken place and now the war has temporarily ceased. Yet we know that it is bound to start again. The problem has not been solved. And as we see from the past, that problem seems to come back in Israel. And we know that it is going to become even more intense as days pass by. Now, where is it going to end? How will the final climax going to be? That is what we will see today. Prophet Jeremiah, long back, received God's word. And there he gave a very important prophecy about how the end is going to be and that is what we will study today. We will turn our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. You see, there God says, a great day is going to come. That final day for Israel. And it says it's going to be a time of trouble to Jacob and God is going to save him from it. Now shall we read it once again? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. You see, it's so great that day that none is like it. So till now nothing has happened in Israel in this way. So that important day is going to come. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. No, that day is called the time of Jacob's trouble. So it's a day of great trouble that's going to come upon Jacob. But he shall be saved out of it. But ultimately, he will be saved out of the trouble. So today we will see what is this Jacob's trouble and how God will save him from it. When we see Jacob's trouble, we know that Jacob was long dead when this prophecy was made. 
So this prophecy is not about the individual Jacob, but it was referring to the children of Jacob, who are the children of the nation of Israel we see now. Jacob was the founding father of the nation of Israel. And we all know that Jacob was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they are the forefathers of uh, the nation of Israel. And particularly Jacob, because Jacob's 12 sons became the 12 tribes which became the nation of Israel. So they were called the children of Israel. And we know that the name Israel also was the name that God gave to Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And after that, his children were called as children of Israel. And so on till today. The entire nation is called after this man, Jacob. So Jacob's trouble refers to the trouble that's going to come upon the nation of Israel. And Jeremiah says that it's going to be a day such as none was there like that before. So it's going to be a great time of trouble and God is going to save him from that trouble. So while talking about Jacob's trouble, today I want to present to you a beautiful comparison of the life of Jacob with the nation of Israel. Jacob, the forefather, we can see as a type of the children of Israel, of the nation of Israel. Many things that happened in the life of Jacob, we can see it repeated in the nation of Israel. We know that all things were written for our admonition. All things teach us deep lessons. And today we will see about the nation of Israel in the life of their forefather Jacob. We know about Jacob, how he was the son of Isaac. In fact, he was the twin brother of Esau. And when Rebekah was in labor pains, it was told that she had two nations in her womb. And that's why she had so much trouble. And finally, when the children were born, Esau was born first, but very peculiarly, the second son, Jacob, was born holding on to the hill of Esau. It was so remarkable that it is noted in the Bible. And that's how his name also came to be Jacob. Jacob means the hill catcher. He wanted to come out first, but Esau came in. And he wouldn't let Esau out easily. And the same thing we see when they grow up also. Jacob very much wanted to be the firstborn. And he wanted to take that from Esau somehow. And one day he got that opportunity. When he was cooking some food and Esau comes back from a hunting tour and is very hungry. And then he asks Jacob for some food. And that's when Jacob took advantage of the situation. And he said, I'll give you all the food you want, but you must give me your birthright. You swear and tell that I am the firstborn. And then you can have the food. There you see, even to his own brother, he was not willing to share his food without first getting something from him. And we know the story. Esau was so hungry that he was willing to give his birthright to his brother in exchange for a meal. And we know how after some years, Isaac was getting old and he thought he would die. And he calls Esau and asks him to go and get this favorite venture meat so that he may eat it and bless Esau before he died. And this Jacob overheard, and we know what he did. When Esau was gone out searching for the deer meat to get to his dad, 
he and his mom hitched a plan. They cut a lamb and and Jacob goes to Isaac as though he was Esau. And he says, Dad, I brought you the food and and he lies to him. And then Isaac, as he was blind, and he fell into this trap. And without knowing, he blessed Jacob. So the blessings that he had reserved for the firstborn, for Esau, was given to Jacob. Jacob took that blessing. And afterwards, when Esau came with the Venetian meat, Isaac was surprised. He said, I've already eaten and I've already given the blessing. And then when Esau came to know that it was his brother who cheated him, he was very angry and he wanted to kill Jacob. And that is where Jacob's story takes a turn. Jacob, fearing for his life, he runs away. He goes out of the father's house, out of the promised land, into a far-off land, to his uncle Laban. And he lived in Padan Aram, outside this promised land. And that is what we have to see and make note of. So Jacob, he left the father's place, the promised land, and went to the far off Padam Aram to his uncle Laban. And there he stayed for a long time. And you know the story about what happened there. Laban was an even more cunning person than Jacob. Jacob had successfully cheated his brother, his father, and he had a way of getting things for himself, whatever he wanted. Now he had come to Laban and Laban was double clever than Jacob. And we see how he outsmarted Jacob every single time. Jacob falls in love with his uh, younger daughter Rachel. And when he asks for her hand in marriage, Laban says, work for me seven years and I will give you my daughter. In those days, the boy had to give a dowry to the girl's father for his consent to give his daughter in marriage. And Jacob was asked to slog for seven years to marry Laban's daughter. And then he does it. He works for seven years and working those days was not like having a software job. It was very difficult, hard work. In the sun and in the rain and in the cold, he had to take care of all the cattle and livestock of Laban. And he was faithful and he did it. At the end of those seven years, we know the story. Laban cheated Jacob by giving him his first daughter. Not the daughter he loved. And then when Jacob found out and asked him, what is this you have done? I struggled for seven years for your second daughter, Rachel, but you have given me Leha. Then Laban said, will anyone give the second daughter having the first daughter at home? So first daughter only should be given. And then he says, what is it? You take my second daughter also. But you work seven more years for that. There you see Jacob. He had to work seven more years if he wanted the second daughter. And there he agreed for that also. And seven more years he struggled with Laban to work for him. So his life was very, very difficult and miserable. Yet there he was and was struggling and then he married these two women and had children. And then we know the story, we can read that in, in the book of Genesis. And uh, he began to prosper also. God was with him and uh, there also we read that Laban cheated Jacob several times. Jacob says in one instance how Laban changed his wages ten times. So he was not a man of words. He would somehow or the other see that Jacob 
he ended up paying more. And that's how it was. And, but in spite of all this, Jacob became very prosperous. And there came a time when Jacob feared that the sons of Laban may even kill him for his possessions because he had grown to be more prosperous and they were envious of Jacob and Jacob thought that his sons may murder him for his money and cattle and livestock. And so what he thought was it's best to go back to his father's place. So there he makes a plan and he gathers all his livestock and his wives. He had four wives, we know, and his children and, and suddenly he flees. And that is when he is coming back to the land of promise. He had left it in fear of Esau and now he's coming back 20 years later. So that is the scene which we have to remember. And we know the story, of course, where the story about Laban. Laban chases Jacob and then he, they meet up and then there is this uh, uh, argument and all this tension that happens there. And finally, they both agree that none of them will cross the land to harm each other. And that's when they make a covenant and set up that uh, stone. I think it's called Mispa. Where Jacob says, I will not cross this border to come into your land and you should not do that uh, and come to my place. And so, after having done that, he will start going into the land of Canaan. That is when his trouble starts. And the trouble was so great and Jeremiah says, it was like the travel pain of a pregnant woman. And that is what we can see this uh, in uh, one verse above in Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 6. We can see God describing the day of trouble. Ask ye now and see whether a man that travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his lions? as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. See, what did we read that? It says, God is asking them, Ask ye now, and see whether a man that travail with child. Yes, he's asking, can a man have this labor pains? Can a man have birth pangs? No one has heard such a thing, but... Wherefore? Do I see every man with his hands on his lions? But God says, He sees every man with his hands on his lion. Because they are in great pain. As a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. You see, how is the faces have become pale, out of fear. They are in great pain, he says. So such was the experience of Jacob as he came back to the father's place and all this happened because his brother Esau having come to know that Jacob is coming back he had gathered a lot of people and he was coming to destroy Jacob even after this 20 years of separation Esau had not forgotten what Jacob had done he was still same angry man and he wanted to take revenge and Jacob, knowing that, fears greatly. And this is what uh, we read uh, in the book of uh, Genesis, when we see in uh, chapter 32, verse 6, uh, Genesis 32, 6. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and four hundred men with him. You see? So, here... He sends messengers and the messengers come back and say that Esau is coming to meet you with 400 men. Like I say, army is coming upon Jacob. So Jacob is obviously very, very afraid and we read in verse 7. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed 
and he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and herds and the camels into two bands you see he was in great fear he knew that Esau is not coming in peace because he's bringing 400 people with him he knows what Esau wants to do he knows that his entire family will be destroyed and such was the situation so much so that he had to divide his family into two groups he thought if Esau falls on one group at least another group can escape so that was the situation brothers and sisters we all have faced difficult times but there are some times which is very very difficult in in every way it is like situation in which you are about to lose everything you have all your property and, and maybe even your life that is the kind of situation that jacob faced now he was here out in the open he can't go back to laban now he had to go forward but there isa was coming he was all by himself with his wives and small children and with all his oxen and flock now everything seems to be destroyed so nothing there was he could do to save himself and that was the situation here brothers and sisters in verse 32 8 we read and said if esau come to the one company and smite it then the other company which is left shall escape so that was the situation there so brothers and sisters that is the jacob's great day of trouble the trouble was too intense for him and he was facing a very very dangerous future and that's what we see uh, as in jeremiah everyone had pains like labor pains and they'd be compelled and in verse 7 Alas for that day is great so that none is like it it is even the time of Jacob's trouble but he shall be saved out of it so that's it so Jacob's great day of trouble had finally come upon him but the prophet said he will be saved out of it so that is what we have to now understand so having seen Jacob and his story now we will see the same thing happen to the nation of israel right from that time they rejected jesus christ as their messiah so that is when the turning point comes the change the big change in the life of jacob as it happened when he took the birthright and he cheated his father and he had to run away to padam aram the same situation happened to israel when god sent his son jesus to israel the people of israel rejected him and they crucified him and that is when god's anger came upon them just as god made jacob to run away from the promised land god scattered the people of israel all over this world they were taken captives into far off gentile nations just like jacob ran away from the promised land and was in a far off land with laban and suffered so much affliction the nation of israel was scattered in all the world they had to leave their homeland and wherever they went they faced a lot of trouble brothers and sisters do you see the parallel here our lord himself had said that this would happen because how much ever he tried to save the people of israel the people were not willing to accept him he says how i wanted to gather you as hen gathers and chicken but you were not willing and therefore he proclaimed that their house will be left desolate and jesus even said that 
they will be scattered, they will be destroyed as a nation and taken captives. Jesus very clearly said these words to them. And we can see that, of course, in, in Luke chapter 21, verse 24. And these shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. You see. So very clearly Jesus said and that they will be... And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. That they will fall by the edge of the sword and... And shall be led away captive into all nations. You see. They will be led away captive into all nations. And these words were fulfilled upon the nation of Israel in 70 AD. Forty years after Jesus said these words, the Romans came upon Jerusalem. They put a siege around it and finally they entered it and destroyed everything. The temple was destroyed, the city was destroyed. And nearly a million people were killed by the sword and the remaining were taken captives into all the places of the world. That's when the diaspora started. The Jews had to wander everywhere in the world. But they were not allowed to stay there. And till the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled, Gentiles will take hold of the city. That is what Jesus says in Look. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. You see, very clearly Jesus said that Jerusalem will be trodden down by Gentiles and Israel will be scattered in all the world. So brothers and sisters, just as Jacob was forced to leave the homeland, was forced to leave the father's house, the promised land, and go off and live in a far off land, in the Gentile land, with his uncle Laban. The people of Israel were made to leave their homeland and were scattered in far off Gentile nations. And wherever they went, they had trouble. Just as Jacob, they were aliens and strangers, and we know that foreigners, being a minority, are at the mercy of others. They don't have any rights and they have, don't have any protection. And since they are in someone else's land, they have to adjust in everything and everybody will take advantage of it. And that is exactly what happened to the people of Israel. They suffered in every place they went, in Europe and in Asia and in all the world. In Germany, in Poland, in Russia, and even in India. Wherever they went, they had to face hardship. And that was kind of a punishment also, which God sent upon them. Just like Jacob was punished for, his, for cheating his dad and his brother, so also God let the nation of Israel suffer in all the places. The suffering was so great in every place that a Jew would ask, why was I ever born as a Jew? So great was the suffering wherever they went. So they had to toil for others. They had to be at the mercy of others. And this happened for a long time. And in Jacob's case, as we see, 20 years he was in other foreign lands. And he had suffering. And after 20 years, he came back to the promised land. So also, the people of Israel were scattered for nearly 20 decades. And after these 20 decades, they are supposed to come back. And that is what happened, as we see, with the nation of Israel. Brothers and sisters, we all know the history. That is one of the advantage of living in the last days. We know what all has already been fulfilled and now we know what to expect next. The nation of Israel started coming back to the promised land. 
And that is also what was prophesied by the same prophet. The same prophet, Jeremiah, in chapter 30, who said that there will be a time of great trouble for Jacob. He also very clearly predicted that Jacob will come back to the promised land. And that we see from verse 1 onwards. Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 1 onwards, we see how that just as Jacob came back to the promised land, the Jews would be brought back to the same promised land and what all would happen there. So, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. You see, God is saying to Jeremiah, Whatever I am about to say, you write it in a book. Why? Because it is so important. What is orally said may be forgotten. But since this is a very important prophecy, and that will be understood many, many years later, it had to be written in a book and preserved. Brothers and sisters, you and I are studying that same book today. What was written by the prophet Jeremiah, the words of God which came to the prophet, that is the very words that we are studying today. And what God says there, verse 3. For lo, the days come, said the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, said the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. You see. So what is God saying? God is saying that he will bring back his people to the promised land, so that they may receive it as their inheritance. So God is saying God will bring them back. Just as God brought back Jacob after 20 years, God is going to bring the people of Israel after 20 decades to the promised land so that they may receive it as an inheritance. You see, though Jacob was made to leave the father's house, yet he was brought back after 20 years. See, though they did many things, wrong things, their choice was wrong and whatever they did, they did. Yet, God knew what they would do and God had it planned such a way so as to give us a pattern of what he's going to do on a greater level. So what all happened in the life of Jacob is a lesson for us. He's a figure of what God would do with the nation of Israel. That's how God made things to happen in a certain way so that we may have this clear lesson. So that is the wisdom of God, that is the way God works. In all the other types also we see. God guided them in certain ways so that that can be a figure of greater things. And we know that every story that was written, were written to teach us about God's dealings. And all that was a shadow of what God would do through his son Jesus. And here also in the same way. God scattered them all over the world. God let the city of Jerusalem be destroyed. And God let the Gentiles take control of it. All this he did when they rejected his son Jesus. It was a punishment that came upon them. Even as they said after asking Pilate to crucify Jesus, they said, may this blood be upon us and our children. And the same thing happened. And God let that same thing happen and, and they were scattered. And they were totally destroyed as a nation and as a, as a people, they scattered everywhere. But that was also only for a certain time. God was not permanently destroying them. But God was only punishing them, chastising them for a certain period. That is very important we should remember. 
And after that certain time was over, he would bring them back. The same thing that happened in Jacob's life, we see happening in the history of Israel. Brothers and sisters, this is what our Lord also even said in, in Luke, when he prophesied about the destruction that was going to come upon Israel. This is what he said. We'll read once again Luke 21, 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. You see, they will fall by the edge of the sword, and they'll be taken captives into all the land. Until when? Until a certain period only. We'll read that once again. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. There you see. It is until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. It is until a certain time. And that is the times of Gentiles. And once that is fulfilled, they have to come back. And we know what the times of Gentiles is all about. That is when God allowed the Gentiles to take possession of the promised land. The city was trodden down by the Gentiles, the Arabs and the Saracens and the Turks and even the, the European people under Pope. They are all Gentiles. They took control of Jerusalem because God gave the time to them. But there was a certain time only, not indefinitely, not forever, but only until the time was over. And meanwhile, the people of Israel were scattered in all the world. They were not allowed to go back to that land and settle. That is how it was for nearly 2,000 years. Brothers and sisters, just like Jacob went out for 20 years, the nation of Israel was scattered for 20 years. But later, God would bring them back. Why? Because God had promised the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he would give this land of Canaan to their children forever as an eternal possession. God had very clearly said that uh, to the fathers. We see that in Genesis chapter 17, verse 8. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. That was the promise. God had said, I will give you the land of Canaan, the all of Canaan. And to thee and to thy children, and they will possess it as an everlasting possession. So permanently and forever, the land belongs to the children of Abraham. That is what God had promised. So though temporarily, they were scattered in all the world. They were removed from that place. Yet God would bring them back because of the promise he made to the forefathers. So there you see, brothers and sisters, what God promised he would do. He did it. And that is what we see in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 3. We'll read that once again. For lo, the days come, said the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, said the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Okay, so there you see. But you know, most Christians and Bible scholars, they misunderstand this verse. And they say that this coming back from captivity refers to coming back from Babylonian captivity. And when God says, I will end their captivity and bring them back to this land, they say that this already fulfilled when the Jews came back from Babylon after this 70 year captivity. So they say that all this is already fulfilled. But brothers and sisters, that's a big mistake to think that this prophecy is already fulfilled. Because 
after they came back, they were again scattered in 70 AD. You know that Titus came back, the Roman governor, he destroyed the city and took them captives, just as Jesus said would happen, happened. They fell to the sword and they were taken captives and their land was given to the Gentiles. So, that time this prophecy was not fulfilled. Because if they came back from Babylon and again they were scattered, still it is not fulfilled. But here God says, I will bring them back and they should be there permanently. They should not be again taken captives. Because the same God in the same book had very clearly said that when he brings them back finally, he will see that they will permanently inherit that land. Even as God had said to Abraham that the land of Canaan, their children will receive as an everlasting inheritance, they should have it permanently. They should not again lose it. That thing didn't happen when they came back from Babylon. So this prophecy is still future. And, and brothers and sisters, in the same book of Jeremiah, very clearly God says that. Finally, when he brings them back, it's going to be forever. They're not again going to be dislodged from that place. They're not again going to be scattered. They're not going to lose that land, whatsoever. So that we see in Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 6. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. You see, that is what God says he will do. He says, I will bring them back to this land, I will build them and not tear them down. Now when they came back from Babylon, again they were torn down in 70 AD. So that these words were not fulfilled when they came back from Babylon. So here God says, I will build them and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. When they came back from Babylon, they were again uprooted in AD 70. So that prophecy was never fulfilled. But now God says, I will bring them back and plant them and not pluck them up. I will build them and I will not tear them down. So this is a very clear sign of the last days, of what God is going to do in the last days. And brothers and sisters, we all know the history. The same way as God had promised, God brought them back. God brought them back. You know, just as Jacob, after the end of 20 years, he realized that he had to go back to the land of Canaan, the land of promise. The Jews, they realized that they had to go back. God made them want to go back. How? Because of the troubles they started facing in other countries. Just like Jacob suffered so much in the hands of Laban. And there came a time when he thought that Laban's sons will destroy him completely. That is when he decided he will go back to his own country, the place which God had promised to their forefathers. So in the same way, the people of Israel, they somehow managed in all the countries for so long, but there came a time when they could no longer remain in those strange lands. They could no longer continue because they realized that they will be doomed if they stay there. And we know what happened. They would have been destroyed and that is what happened. Just before they started coming back, we know in 1945, that was the ultimate, we can say, this uh, Holocaust happened. When Hitler killed six million Jews he, during the Second World War. He gathered up all the Jews in Poland and in, in Germany and in, in all the places 
And he started systematically killing them in gas chambers. We know this, brothers and sisters. And all this was the great time of trouble. That Just like Jacob realized that Laban's sons will totally destroy them. In the same way, the people of Israel were hated in every place they went. Why? Because they were strangers, number one. And because of their ways, which was totally different. And because of their prosperity also. Laban's sons hated Jacob because he was very prosperous. They envied him. And so the, the world hated the Jews because they were prosperous. And they were everywhere. They were different and they were coming up so good and they didn't like it. And of course they hated the Jews because of what they did. They had killed their Messiah. And therefore even in the Christian countries where they tried to make a living, they were hated. We know that they were blamed for almost everything. Even when the Black Death happened, Jews were blamed because of your presence, this plague has come upon us. So they suffered in so many different ways all through these 2,000 years they were scattered because as a punishment for what they did. Yet finally, God would end it, end their captivity. And bring them back. And all these sufferings and this holocaust and all this made them want to go back to their own land. They decided, they realized that they will not be safe anywhere else in the world. And that they had to have their own land. And have their own country. And that's when they started coming back in ships and in airplanes and in different ways. The Jews started coming back at the end of the 19th century. And then slowly the population of Israel, the Jews, started increasing. And brothers and sisters, until later on in 1948, they became a, an independent state. Now, brothers and sisters, one more thing I have to tell you is that all this was not fulfilled when Israel came back from Babylonian captivity. Because of one more important thing that we have to note here, that is in the words that God said to Jeremiah in chapter 30, verse 3. For lo, the days come, said the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, said the Lord. See, whom will he bring back, God says there. Shall we read again? For lo, the days come, said the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, said the Lord. See, he says, I'll bring back my people, the people of Israel and Jacob from their captivity. No, this did not fulfill when they came back from Babylon. Why? Because only the Jews, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, the southern kingdom, they were taken captive to Babylon. They only returned back to Israel under the guidance and leadership of Ezra and Zerubbabel and, and they came back. But here God says, I will bring back the people of Israel and Jacob. Shall we read that once again? For lo, the days come, said the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah. You see, Israel and Judah, God says. Now, that never happened when the people came back from Babylon. Because only the people of Judah came back. Israel, as we know, that was become another state altogether in the times of Rehoboam, the, the third king of uh, Israel. We know that at that time, ten tribes separated out. And they became the children of Israel. And here, the southern states, the Judah and Benjamin, became a different nation. Only that nation was taken to Babylon and they came back. But here God says, all Israel and Judah, he will bring them back. And that happened only now, when God started bringing all the Jews from all over the world, from all the nations, they were scattered. They started coming back. They started coming back. And even now there are some people who are going back. So brothers and sisters, so this prophecy 
has been fulfilled in our times. People started coming back and, and, and one more thing is, when they come back, of course, we, will, we see that they will have a time of trouble. Uh, but after that, God says, God will deliver them. And in the subsequent verses, also we read something which never happened when Jews came back from Babylon. That we see in verse 8 and 9. For it shall come to pass in that day, said the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. So God says God will relieve Jacob of all the yoke that was upon him for all these years. Like for 20 years he was serving Laban and, and he was struggling to take care of his livestock. But later on he was relieved from it. So the people of Israel also, they will be loosed from their, their yoke that they had to serve all other people. They had to please everyone wherever they went. But now God says he will free them from that yoke. And verse 9, But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. So God says they will serve only God and serve David their king, whom God will raise them up. Now that didn't happen when they came back from Babylonian captivity. There was not David there. But here now it will happen because when they come back and when they are delivered from that great day of trouble, then the deliverer is going to come back. Jesus will return and raise David again in his kingdom and bring back all the ancient worthies, the forefathers, and David also will be raised and David will again rule. So this did not fulfilled when they came back from Babylon. Many Christians think that because the Jews rejected Jesus and crucified him, that God is totally done with them. And that is what they, they feel that. And, and when we see people of Israel coming back into the same land, most of the Christians, they don't support this. And they are also against Israel. The Christian nations also, in general, they don't see this as an act of God. Because they think that all these prophecies long back fulfilled when they came back from Babylon. Now, this wonderful thing that is happening in front of our eyes, they don't see this as a fulfillment of promise. Why? Because they think that God is done with Israel. Because they rejected the Messiah, they are forever cast away. But brothers and sisters, that is not to be. Because God only rejected them for a time, not forever. God let them suffer for their rejection of the Messiah and, and their sins. But God will not destroy them completely. God has a great plan for them. And that's how he said he will bring them back and establish them permanently in that place. So, brothers and sisters, even as our Lord said that they will be taken captives and Jerusalem shall be trodden down until a certain time. That is, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Very clearly, Jesus said. So, that is when God had a different plan to call out a people from the Gentiles. When the people of Israel rejected Jesus, God scattered them and from that time God started choosing those who believed in his son of all the Gentiles. So that's when the gospel is started, the period of grace when all Gentiles who believed in Jesus were accepted as God's children. So that's when the favor started to go to the Gentiles. Until that time, only the Jews were the most blessed people, the chosen nation. But then, when they rejected Jesus, the, the God's son, God scattered them. That, that time of favor ended for them, and that favor was given to Gentile believers. We Christians. Just because we believed, we received God's grace. All the promises of God became ours, 
and God is protecting us and has become our father and blessing all those who believe in his son. So this period started. And this is what we understand as times of Gentiles. There was a certain time given for to call out the church from among the Gentiles. So that started happening and the Jews were scattered and they were suffering. Here the believers received God's grace and, and they were being developed and, uh, and God started calling out and choosing from them a peculiar people for himself. But all that should also come to an end finally. That's what Jesus said. That the Jews will be scattered until the times of Gentile are fulfilled. But once it is fulfilled, they have to come back. So that means the time of favor given to the Gentiles also has to end. The Christians who received God's favor, that also has to end. Just like the Jewish age ended and the gospel age started. So the gospel age also has to come to an end. That is what is happening right now. Christians also are losing God's favor now. Why? Because just like the Jews, when Jesus came to them at the first time, they become just Jews for the namesake. They were worldly and they were not after God and God's laws and they were hypocrites and they were doing things which God did not like it. And they rejected their son also. In the same way, Christians have become just nominal Christians, just namesake they are Christians. They are not following the Lord Jesus. They are not living to serve and please God. They have become just like the world, people of the world. And therefore, they will lose the favor of God in the end. God will select whoever is worthy and then reject the, all the rest of the Christendom. That is what he is going to do. Just like he rejected the people of Israel when he came first. Now, when he comes again the second time, he is going to reject the, all these nominal Christians. Only those who are faithful, he will save them. But the rest will be rejected. So, that is how the world is going to end. And when the world ends, even these nominal Christians who just are Christians by name will all be destroyed. Just as it happened to the nation of Israel, it's going to happen to the Christian nations also. So, brothers and sisters, there's a time for everything. And the Jews were rejected only temporarily so that God may call out and prepare a class of people from the Gentiles. But once they are all selected, their age will also end. The time of favor will end and then the Jews will return to the favor. So this is very beautifully explained to us by Paul in Romans chapter 11. There, the entire chapter you can read where Paul is saying to Christians, do not boast yourself against the nation of Israel. Don't think that you are above them because he says you are not the root. You are only branches. The, the nation of Israel, they are the olive tree planted by God. They are the ones, the people of the covenant to whom all the promises of God belong. Now, some were cut off because of unbelief. And you, who are a wild olive tree by nature, were grafted into that original tree. Because of faith you are standing. And they were rejected because of their unbelief. Now do not boast against the root. You are not the root, you are only a branch. And there he says, if God rejected whom he called his own people, he can reject you also. And if God is able to bring you from the wild olive tree and graft them into his covenant, he is able to bring those of his own people again back. That very clearly he says in, in, in the book of uh, Romans chapter 11. You see from verse 17 I'll read. And if some of the branches be broken off, thou being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, 
but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root bears thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. It's not because of our works or goodness, but only because of faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. If God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he spare not thee also. So what he's saying is ultimately that the Jews were cut off because of their unbelief. And the Gentiles were given that opportunity because of their faith. But only for a certain time. Until the times of the Gentiles are over. But once that is finished, again God can bring back the natural branches. And, and if we become unworthy, he says, For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he spare not thee also. So, we can also be rejected. That's what will happen in the end of this gospel age, brothers and sisters. So, God did not ultimately cast away his people. That we can see in uh, verses 1 and 2. Romans 11, 1 and 2. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I am also an Israel and the seed of Abraham and the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people which he foreknew. Very clearly, he says. God has not cast them off permanently, but for a time. Until he could bring in the Gentiles also. You see. And in, in, the, in the subsequent verses, it says that God only caused them to be blinded so that he may have mercy upon us. That we can see here in, in Romans 11 verse 32. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. You see, God hath concluded them in unbelief so that he might have mercy upon all. If all the people of Israel had accepted Jesus, then where would there be the chance for you and me to become God's children? God's required number of people would be found in Israel only and God will set up his kingdom there only. But God let them be blinded so that he may have mercy upon all. So at the end of this gospel age, now we too had our share of God's grace and and many had this chance to believe in the gospel and 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 to get into the kingdom. But then what will happen? That is what we see in verse 25 at the end of the Gentile period. What will happen? In chapter 11 verse 25 we read this. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. See, he's saying that I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. There's a mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. No, Christians are wise in their own conceits. They think that they are the only people of God. And that God has rejected and cast away the people of Israel forever. No, brothers and sisters. God has a plan for them also. That is what we read here. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. You see, until a certain time. You see, blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. That means the blindness is only temporary. The blindness is only until the Gentile times be fulfilled. Once the fullness of Gentiles has come in, the blindness of Israel will go away. And they will also be saved. And that is a wonderful thing that we read in the next verse 11.26. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. There you see. How clearly he says. And so all Israel shall be saved. You see. All Israel shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from their blindness. God will save them. How? By sending the deliverer. Who is the deliverer who comes from Zion? 
as it is written there shall come out of zion the deliverer you see out of zion the deliverer that is jesus christ coming for the second time out of heaven that is the deliverer he will come and what will he do there shall come out of zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from jacob you see he will turn away the ungodliness from jacob he will turn away their blindness their ungodliness he will change them and he will make them be saved brothers and sisters that is what we see very clearly given here so god has a beautiful wonderful plan for the people of israel and that is already in progress just as jacob came back people of israel have already come back they started coming back in the end of 19th century and then in the 20th century more and more people came back in 1948 they even became a nation and brothers and sisters we know very clearly that god's words have been fulfilled and they are now they are back in their own land they are now again planted and built there and now this is going to be forever and the next stage is what we can expect as we see in jeremiah so when they come back when jacob comes back it's not all going to be very easy this transition you know these times of gentiles ending and uh, and the jews coming back to favor it's all not going to happen smoothly jacob had to face esau and face a very very hard time in his life that is what happened as we saw earlier on the birth pangs should come upon him the tri- the trial of a a woman with child such would be the pain of jacob and all these pains will come upon him when he returns to the land and that is what we see happening to the people of israel in every single detail we see whatever happened to jacob is happening to the people of israel like the birth pangs pain after pain is coming to them as we said in our early class you see the end of the world is also will come as a travel upon the woman with child a woman who is about to deliver will not be delivered in just one pain it is a series of pains which will come back again and again there will be a, a small time of interval of relaxation but again the pain will again and again come back and the same thing is happening to the people of israel as we saw in jeremiah every man undergoing this travel pain that is how it has been they have had such a strong opposition ever since the time they started coming back the arabs were not happy and none of the countries surrounding them they are willing to give that place to israel nevertheless they started coming back and coming back and making claims for that land as a land that was theirs long before 2000 years before that that time and they started to increase in population but then there was this opposition and when finally in 1948 the united nations decided to give them that land none of the arabs countries they were willing to accept it they opposed it to the maximum when they could not prevent it and the nation of israel was formed in 1948 may 14th they declared war the next day itself five countries fell upon israel they declared war sent their armies they said that they will destroy israel completely but then you know what happened and just as god had said that he will deliver them god delivered them israel was not only able to defend the land that was given to them but even increase the land defeat all these five nations that was remarkable thing this was nothing but the act of god this proves that god's favor is coming back to the people of israel it is god who brought them back it is god who is establishing them it is god who is defending them and even after that the, the arabs countries they were keeping on trying to destroy israel but they were not able to do for some time but later on in 1967 egypt geared up for war they prepared themselves hundreds and 
thousands of tanks and aeroplanes and army they prepared and also Syria also with them and they wanted to attack Israel. Israel knowing of this attack, they had a preemptive strike and we know about the six day war, how they destroyed Egypt and Syria in just six days and conquered all of Sinai Peninsula. And they were so victorious. So again and again the Arabs have tried to destroy Israel and push them out of the map as the Egyptians they said they will do. But they are failing. Every single time they are failing. And you know Israel they are trying to make peace with these people. Just like Jacob did. You know what Jacob did when he returned back and, and Esau was coming to fight with him. You know what Jacob did? You read there in the book of Genesis, you know. He sent many good cattle and sheep ahead of him as gift for Esau. Many times he's sending them. The best of his livestock is sending them as gifts to Esau in order to make peace with him. But of course, Esau was not pacified. He still continued to approach so that is exactly what is happening with the people of Israel also these days. After they came back and they were settled, they were happy to take the little place, half of the promised land. And yet uh, the Arabs, they didn't want to let them live. They tried in all ways to destroy Israel. But Israel is willing to make peace. They gave back all the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt just to make peace. All that land they had in their control, but they're willing to give it back just to make peace. And also the Gaza and the West Bank. That also they gave them back. They gave them the rights to have their own government to do whatever they like. But even after that, there is no peace. They're not willing to live peacefully. The very places given to them, they're given that place to this terrorist organization like Hamas and, and of course first there was this Arafat, the terrorist who, who became popular going around the world saying that Israel is the culprit and that uh, Israel is the aggressor and he must uh, support to him. And finally he also became the leader of the Palestinian people and, and we know all about that and he started the Intifada where often again and again the Palestinians would rebel and throwing stones and uh, making uh, trouble. People of Israel gave them the land of Gaza and the West Bank also. And there also, till today we see that they have given control to this terrorist organization like Hamas, who are receiving support and who are in these cities making tunnels and preparing rockets and firing them at Israel. They don't want peace. Israel wants peace. They want to live peacefully with these people. Yet these people are not willing, the Arabs are not willing to live peacefully with them. And, and they fired 4,000 rockets. And when Israel fights back, now in the world media, it is shown as if that Israel is the aggressor. How unfair it is. And Satan has been very successful in this, this campaign against Israel. Not only the, the Arabs, the people in Gaza and West Bank, but the whole world is against the nation of Israel. All are supporting the Arabs. There are processions held everywhere, protests held everywhere, supporting the Palestinian people. Even Christians who are ignorant of God's plans, they feel sympathy for the people in Gaza. It's okay for them, for Israel to be bombed. 4,000 rockets were sent on Israel. Nobody is talking about that. But if Israel sends their airplanes and bomb Gaza, you know, that is highlighted. And brothers and sisters, uh, that is how it is. And, and also the, the people of Gaza, they are receiving funds from all the world and huge millions of dollars. And everybody wants to help the people in Gaza because of their 
poverty and children and women are there. But all this is going into the hands of the terrorist organization Hamas, which is using these funds to make bombs and to try to destroy Israel. So this is what is happening and uh, right now they fired 4,000 rockets. Israel was able to protect itself in this latest technology using this Iron Dome anti-missile defense system, which 98% of these rockets were destroyed in the air, but even then there was this damage. But then, brothers and sisters, it is not going to stop. It is only a small break, we can say. But again, Hamas will continue the protest. And day by day, the situation is going from back to worse. Brothers and sisters, we see just as Jacob was about to face Esau. Esau is coming closer and closer every day. And the, and the final climax is going to be coming upon Jacob. So in the same way, Israel is going towards that final day. As we read in Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7. The great day, none like that day. Finally, all this is going to lead up to that final pain. That pain from which Israel will be delivered. And that is what we are expecting. This should escalate more and more until it becomes an all-out war. Now Israel on one side and the whole world on the other side. And that is how we know Armageddon is going to take place. That is when Jacob's trouble will come upon it. And in that very crisis, that, that climax of this crisis, God says he will deliver the people of Israel. So that is what we can expect in the future. So brothers and sisters, till now we saw this comparison, how Jacob's life is being replayed in the history of Israel. Now, finally, how that Jacob's pain is going to be and how God is going to deliver Israel from it, that we will see in our next class, God willing. And that we will see how the end will be and, and what will be the outcome, what we can expect in the forthcoming days and years. So, until then, may God bless you.